I wish you all a warm welcome to this conference on students as co-creators in higher education. And the word university is a shortening of Universitas Magistrorum et Scholarium. I don't know whether any of you uh, is uh, or are uh, proficient in uh, Latin. Arms up. That's lucky me. But uh, it means community of masters and scholars or teachers and students. Mestare olariungar. That's the very meaning of the word university. Isn't that wonderful? It emphasizes this joint community of teachers and students. And this is very important, I find, in an age where students are increasingly referred to as customers or consumers. We really have to remind ourselves about this, that the tightly knit community of masters and scholars is what defines a university. Teachers and students are partners in learning and teaching, not providers and consumers. But why is this so important? There are several reasons, a number of reasons. But I find that the most important one is that having students as co-creators improves learning and teaching. The British researcher Graham Gibbs and colleagues have carried out a study of departments at 11 world-class research-intensive universities in eight different countries. Universities pretty much like Uppsala University. And the departments were all chosen because they are excellent at teaching. Case studies were undertaken to identify the leadership activities that these departments at these departments. And the question was, what kind of leadership creates and supports excellent teaching? teaching? It was found that the leadership associated with excellent teaching was multifaceted and varied. There were a number of approaches to achieve this. Still, all departments share two characteristics. The first one was that all department heads had a high degree of credibility by their staff. They, the heads themselves, were excellent teachers. Many times they were also uh, uh, recipients of teaching awards at the university or even nationally. And the second thing was that they all involved students. They did not just carry out routine collection of student feedback, push They involved students in discussion on, of what was working well and what was not, and any discussions of what alternatives might work even better. They involved students in decision-making of teaching and in implementation of new ideas, which, uh, with students acting as peer tutors, for example. And students were also involved in implementing student-centered uh, teaching methods. The students at these departments reported that the, uh, the faculty was very much a community or a family which, with approachable staff who were really interested in student views. So here's the trick. If you are a department head and you want your department to be excellent at teaching, be an excellent teacher yourself and involve the student. What about uh, student participation at Uppsala University then? Have we learned the trick? That's the question. We have a long tradition of student participation. I guess all Swedish institutions would say that. It's something we really pride ourselves in. Guidelines for educational activity and development, Pedagogiska Programmet, strongly illustrates this partnership idea. It, is, it clearly specifies the role of both the student and the university in creating a high-quality uh, education. In 2013, an international panel came here to Uppsala University, and they evaluated our way of uh, enhancing teaching and learning, developing what we're doing. for the people inside the university, if you haven't forgot already. The panel was impressed with the commitment to educational uh, development among the Uppsala University students and uh, they really pointed to the importance of students as change agents, as catalysts for change. And that was, was what they had noticed at Uppsala University. They also highlighted the go good collaboration that they found, the partnership between students and staff at Uppsala University, which really then Going back to the definition of a university is a very nice uh, sort of a, um, confirmation of that we are a university at all. 
uh, they draw some special attention to a student-led group which uh, aimed at developing student participation at Uppsala University. Uh, and uh, they really commended the work that they did, uh, where they tried to build knowledge on how to pursue this question. And uh, given all this bragging, it sounds as if we could uh, lean back and rest. But the panel suggested the opposite. Because they had noted that the picture was very fragmented. Even though there were, as uh, we heard, islands of very good practice, there were also dark continents. Um, <laughs> or, or maybe not completely dark them, but uh, spotted uh, continents. Although there were initiatives for, because this was the focus here, peer-assisted learning in different places within, places within UU, uh, these initiatives tended to be unaware of each other's existence, and uh, several initiatives had uh, petered out, died, because of lack of support or because uh, uh, the burning soul in charge, the student or the teachers, uh, had went somewhere else. So they had no sustainability or long-term survival chances. Given this, the panel recommended you, you to have students and teachers working together to find an Uppsala model for sustainable, integrated student participation in instruction or teaching and learning, learning and teaching. And they found that this should be done in a prescribed period of time, it should be supported. And the, the next thing that happened was that uh, the students at Uppsala University sent a proposal to the vice chancellor, how about going, how about to do this? And the vice chancellor said that this is a very good idea, let's uh, uh, create a project around this. And this is the very reason why we are here today, really. It's all because of this history. I'm sorry that I had to take you all from the ancient Greek uh, um, to here, but I felt I had to do that. That's the reason why. And, uh, and I, a very important part of that we are here today is, of course, the devoted and highly professional work of the ASP team. And that is, as we heard, Sanna, where are you? Sanna, uh, Alexis, we've met, uh, Friedrich, where are you? Outside, uh, uh, arranging for something. And uh, Ulrike, there you are. And this is also the reason why we have the pleasure to welcome an international expert on staff and students co-creating curricula, Sherry Walmer. Sherry's uh, doctoral research is focusing on evaluating the impact of staff and students co-creating curricula in UK higher education. She is particularly interested in the interaction that takes place between students and staff in this process and how perceptions of the curriculum influence co-creation. She is also interested in issues of power and identity and how individuals' narratives can offer insights in how to we measure the impact of co-creation. She has worked in UK higher education for over 14 years Prior to undertaking her PhD, she worked in educational development at the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow. In this role, her interests focused on developing curricula which enabled undergraduate students to engage in co-inquiry with staff in interdisciplinary research teams. So there's a research te teaching linkage uh, aspect on this as well. She has also been actively involved in developing uh, Quality Assurance Agency Scotland's Enhancement Themes, which is a uh, Scotland-wide initiative for raising different questions uh, that has to do with uh, learning and teaching. And uh, she holds an honours degree in English Language and Linguistics, and an MBA in Public Services, and she is also a Fellow of the Higher Education Academy in the UK. And her doctoral research is actually founded by the Higher Education Academy as well. So I wish you a very warm welcome, Sherry. Please enter the stage. And I'm going to do a thing that I feel very bad about, and that is re leaving this room now. Something that I hate when I'm sitting in the audience. But I will be back tomorrow. I had a, a, a tremendous conflict between two extremely interesting and important things. So I'll see you all tomorrow, and I hope that you will have two wonderful and very inspiring days. Thanks a lot. Well, Well, good morning, everyone. Um,
can I say, first of all, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to be a part of what is a really exciting moment in Uppsala's work on active student participation. Um, I arrived on Tuesday evening and I had the pleasure of meeting with colleagues, uh, staff and students, um, both involved in the ASP project and CMIS, and we had wonderful conversations. I think you're at a really exciting point in time. Perhaps before I start, I can point out two things. Firstly, I'd like to take a huge step back from presenting myself as an international expert. I come here as a humble doctoral research student. I am partway through my data collection. Um, so the ideas that I want to present to you are emergent, they are tentative, but I hope they help frame the discussion that we're going to be part of over the next two days. The other thing which those of you who have traveled to Glasgow will already realize is I'm not native to Glasgow. Um, I am actually English. So those of you that have traveled to Glasgow will perhaps be relieved to know that I don't have a strong Glaswegian accent. So I hope that you can understand me clearly. Um, I will do my best, but if there is anything that um, you miss or that you'd like me to go over again, please do let me know. So. As I said, I want to spend uh, some time with you this morning helping to set the scene for the discussions we're going to have. I'm going to draw upon my doctoral research and the literature that I've been uh, working on. I'm a year and a half in, so I'm right in the middle of my data collection at the moment. I also want to draw on some of my own professional practice of working in academic development and a variety of partnership roles that I've worked in um, during those 14 years either at institutional level, so at a very macro level, dealing with vice chancellors, finance directors, deans of learning and teaching and so on, down to the micro level, individual interactions between myself as a teacher with students or enabling groups of staff and students to work together. So let's begin. I want to do three, th three things. Um, I want to talk about the policy context, and I'm going to draw quite heavily on the UK and US scene at the moment. Um, involving students as partners in learning and teaching in its broadest sense is a hot topic at the moment. There's um, quite intense focus on what this means in UK higher education, both in policy terms, um, there's an, a growing body of research um, focusing on this, hence the studentship for my doctoral research in this area. Um, and so on. So I want to, I want to look at the, the kind of the policy and the theoretical landscape. I'm conscious that we are here, perhaps as researchers, but probably mainly as possible or active practitioners. So I want to talk about what actually does it mean when we're talking about involving students in co-creating curriculum specifically as a dimension of learning and teaching. So we're going to be looking at issues. I want to share with you some of the literature and some of the questions I'm exploring in my own research around um, staff and student personal motivations um, and ideas of impact and success. And I come at this from a critical perspective, particularly when we're talking about impact and how we might measure, observe, discuss and talk about that. And what I'm particularly interested in is individual narratives and how we make sense of this emergent area of practice. Um, I want to pause for a moment before the end of my presentation to talk about where we see ourselves as practitioners in the process. How can we be reflexive, reflective on the work that we're doing whilst we're doing it? So we can take account of the process of partnership as well as our end goals and the product, product that we're focusing on. And then finally, I want to raise some questions of which I don't have the answers to at all. I'm joining you in this conversation, um, but I want you to hold them in your minds as you, you move forward over these next two days and think about your own motivations and your own ideas of what you would like to perhaps take forward as a result of these two days. So let's start with a, a pretty fundamental question. Why involve students at all? And we heard a really eloquent introduction to some of the research already that um, talks about Uppsala's work and history, rich history, in working in partnership with students in various forms. But I'd like to suggest perhaps there are two ideas of why this is important. 
One idea might be that it's just a natural evolution of an ongoing discussion about student engagement in higher education. Many, if not all, universities have a long history of working with students in terms of representation through uh, working with student officers in, from student unions, for example, um, involving students in evaluating through quality enhancement processes and so on, involving inviting students to give feedback. So maybe it's just a logical progression of a point in time, a moment in time that we're at, that we should be looking at saying, well, why aren't we involving students in, in broader roles within the whole learning and teaching endeavour, the, 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 the mastery and scholarship of higher education? So I describe that as perhaps a natural evolution of practice and, and, and the work that we do in universities. Perhaps a second, perhaps more radical agenda, which is not new, but at this point in time, perhaps we're revisiting some of these ideas, is the potential to look at critical theory, critical pedagogy as a way to revisit and re-energise debates around democratising learning. And this is a particular theoretical frame that I'm interested in exploring in my own PhD research. So the roots are in critical pedagogy, authors like Paolo Ferreri, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, some of you may be familiar with some of this literature, really challenging the nature of education, placing it in a political domain. Knowledge is power and so on. Um, and Ferreri um, was particularly interested in challenging this idea of banking of knowledge, whereby knowledge is perceived to be held by somebody in a privileged position and is bestowed upon the learner. Um, who um, has been deemed to be worthy of receiving such knowledge. I'm being evocative but, and I'm paraphrasing, but those ideas of challenging particular issues of power, privilege, prestige and so on, and actually trying to shift the nature of that debate into one of dialogue and reflection that is situated in challenging um, inequality. I, I, I should say that in drawing upon this kind of theoretical framework, it's important to remember the work of Paolo Ferreri and so on, that it is very situated in a political time, a political period, political circumstance. And it's dangerous to simply extract that and say, well, that's applicable to higher education. But I think there is something there about this idea of democratising learning that gives us a valuable lens to think about the collaborative activity between staff and students. So if we hold that thought for a moment, as you might expect from a PhD student, you're very conscious of every word that you use. Um, and this is a nascent field of research and practice. And it would be remiss of me not to point out that some of the terms that are being used um, at the moment, and these are just a range within the UK context. I don't know if you might recognize some of these, of the ways that we're talking about collaborating uh, between staff and students. So perceiving a student as a co-creator, a co-producer, a partner, a co-researcher, a colleague, a change agent, a consultant. Interestingly, and this is just an observation to share, the literature and the way that we talk about this is very much focused on the role of the student. But what happens if we say teacher as co-creator, as change agent, as consultant, as partner? So again, I, I think that we are perhaps not having the discussion about where the focus of attention is on. And we, we need to, if we are genuinely talking about partnership, think about our own practice as teachers and our own identity as teachers when we're interacting with students. So these are some of the phrases that are being used and they're being used interchangeably. And at the moment, I, I personally feel in terms of my professional practice that you have to give space for some of the messiness because this is a creative process and you need to allow things to emerge. But it is important and I, I, I would just stress to be mindful of that these phrases when you might be coming across them um, with presentations such as mine or literature that you might be reading, they overlap and they have been developed for different purposes in different contexts. So at Uppsala, the, we have another phrase, active student participation. And yesterday I was having some really interesting conversations um, in, in my interviews I'm doing with staff and students. I'm, I'm actually putting people on the spot and saying, you know, if I was to ask you within two lines, how would you describe co-creating curricula? 
and I perhaps unfairly said that to colleagues yesterday and it led to a really interesting conversation of well actually we can't describe it in two lines and we don't really want to we want to give space to hear how colleagues across the university adopt and adapt this this terminology and understand it in their own practice and I think again that's a really exciting and important part of the process of thinking about the development of active student participation at Uppsala and other institutions. So what is the literature actually saying about partnership in learning and teaching? So now I'm going to take you through what I describe as my concentric circles of thinking about the broader context. We've talked about student engagement. We're now going to talk about the process of learning and teaching in its broadest sense. I just want to share with you some quotes from the literature which highlight different elements that are important, I think, to this domain of research and practice. So the National Union of Students in the UK uh, developed the Manifesto for Partnership um, a number of years ago. And they talk about student engagement activity and, and their language has shifted along with the policy shift in the UK to, to begin talking about students as partners. But what I like about this, and I need to make sure I press the right button here, is they say partnership is an ethos rather than an activity. How do you know an ethos when you see it? That's tricky, isn't it? Uh, particularly when we're thinking about measurement of impact and you know, how do you know if this is successful? Well, we have a culture of partnership. I've been in some very tricky meetings with senior managers in my time where they've really pushed me on that and said, we're not gonna fund something based on you telling me that there's a culture and ethos of, of this happening. Um, so there's a, a potential tricky issue there, wicked question. Um, Healy and colleagues, and I'm going to talk a bit more about their work later, they talk about partnership not necessarily being about a deficit model where the impact, so this in a sense is a critique of some of the critical pedagogy idea. It's not that I am powerful and you are the disempowered student and I'm the gatekeeper and I'm going to a, we're going to work differently. What they're saying is it, it acknowledges that there are different power relationships there and I think that's probably quite important. We're not saying that when we're co-creating things together that things are necessarily equal. It might be that we just have a different, more explicit conversation about where the power differentials are and that we begin to have a conversation as equals about that. Not necessarily that power is equal because ultimately, particularly around curriculum, often we as teachers are the gatekeepers and we ultimately hold a final veto. Um, so maybe we can explore some of that. Again, my supervisor, Kathy Boville, um, and colleagues over in the US, Alison cook and Peter Felton, have recently um, published a book. She has not paid me to advertise her, um, her recent uh, publication, but um, it is a really useful reference point to be thinking about, particularly from a, an academic development perspective, the dimensions of working with students. And they pick up, and again, I want to just highlight from this quote, this aspect. It's the opposite to conscious opportunity to contribute equally, although not necessarily in the same way. So again, just hold that and think about what does that mean in terms of your own practice? If you are involved in ASP how, at the moment, or you're interested in thinking about opportunities to develop, what, what would that mean in terms of how you interact in the process of partnership? So um, I said that I'd mention Mick Healy and colleagues' work at the Higher Education Academy. This is a fairly recent publication, and I would say it's really useful in terms of helping you think about your own practice. So it, it, the two documents, one is much shorter than the other. Um, they offer a kind of conceptual underpinning of, of, of a way to define partnership, a really useful literature summary, which again, for, particularly for busy colleagues and students, it's quite a pithy document to just read through and, and get a feel for um, the, the various dimensions of the debate. Um, but just to pull out for you today, they talk about four overlapping domains of partnership. So they talk about learning, teaching and assessment as opportunities for active learning. And I know you have um, a number of conversations ongoing um, here at Uppsala to help prepare students to be participants, engaging them as teachers or assessors. So the supplemental instruction model that um, I was talking with colleagues about yesterday might be... Um, an example of that. Um, Subject-based research and inquiry. So I talked, um, it was mentioned earlier, that was predominantly what I focused on, students working as co-researchers in my own 
my, in my work before I took a career break for my PhD. Um, so working in inquiry-based learning mode, where you get staff and students actually generating new knowledge through co-research. Students as change agents through um, research and evaluation specifically on the scholarship of teaching and learning is what, is what they're pulling out um, in that domain of partnership. And finally, um, this last point, curriculum design and pedagogic consultancy. Um, so giving advice and, and, and consultancy on and also actively being involved in developing different parts of the curriculum. Kathy Bovell and colleagues um, will shortly be publishing uh, an article which kind of complements the work coming out of the HEA publication. It, they have been conceptualising the different roles that students play. So a student as co-researcher, a consultant, a representative, a pedagogical co-designer. And I think it's important to say that these roles are often, if, if perhaps they're, they're never exclusive, quite often students get involved in uh, collaboration and partnership work and wear different hats. So a student might be um, the equivalent of your course representative where they are representing student views and, and might become involved in different kind of partnership development work around curricula, a pedagogical co-designer. They may be involved in research and so on and um, as well as a, a representative as well. So um, for the students in the room, have a think about the multifaceted dimension of the different roles you might play and how your learning from those different roles interacts and informs the work that, that you do when you're collaborating with your teachers, with staff at the university. But just returning to what um, Healy and colleagues at the HEA talk about, I want to highlight this, this point to you. From their own literature review, and, and certainly that would um, chime with my own view, um, when you're looking at examples of practice in the literature, there's much around students involved in subtle scholarship of teaching and learning research, students as representatives and being involved in quality enhancement. But um, it's really rare to find opportunities where students are involved um, as partners in designing the curriculum and giving pedagogic advice. And what I would sh share with you and what you might expect I'd, I'd ask um, is... Why is this so? Why is it that students are not included necessarily in this particular domain of learning and teaching, in this particular conversation? And these are just tentative suggestions. Um, drawing on both my research and my uh, previous uh, work experiences, um, I think perhaps part of it is we don't, and I'd be interested in your feedback on this, we don't really talk about what we mean by curriculum in higher education very often, and I'm exploring this in my research with staff in, partic in, in particular. Um, so when sometimes not clear what the possibilities are and what we might be inviting as teachers, students to be involved in, there might be mixed ideas, legitimately mixed ideas about expertise and authority, where and when is it appropriate to co-create things and when is it not? Very often, finding space to do this in a safe, contained way and to be creative is really challenging. So timing and sustainability issues, the logistics of it. For staff and students, sometimes it just feels a little bit too scary, a bit too risky. Um, and sometimes the timing is just not right. So maybe they're just some of the reasons why um, it's rarer to find students involved in co-creating curriculum. So let's return to those, those points. Um, just want to share with you some of my thoughts on this issue of what do we mean by curriculum? And certainly in my own research design, I went through a process of saying, well, what are the examples of staff and students co-creating curricula? Well, actually, if I'm going to try and put some parameters around this, I need to, again, think about how I'm defining curriculum in higher education. So I started to broaden my literature search and, and have a read around, and it became quite, obvious to me at least, and again, as I say, I'm interested in your own perceptions on this, um, that what Barnett and Cope talk about, there's, there's a silence uh, in the sector, certainly in the UK, I don't know how, how it is in Sweden, uh, we don't really talk about curriculum, and, and partly this is because when you start to talk about curriculum, curricula, you start to get into pretty fundamental discussions about the nature and purpose of 
what, what our endeavour is, what, what our university is for, what are we teaching, why are we teaching this, um, why are we addressing this and so on. But some common ideas about curriculum is that it's about subject knowledge and content. Uh, these are some of the ways that we might talk about this with one another. Um, it's a handy sized container that we can fit stuff into, our content, our syllabus and so on. We have a number of, we have a structure, we have time, it's fixed by time, we have a number of credits per module, uh, we have a semester to deliver it in and so on. You might be working within a subject area that is regulated um, by a professional body. I'm not quite sure what the equivalent is within Sweden. So for example, if you want to become a chartered engineer in the UK, you need to be studying a, a recognised degree programme that leads to your chartership um, further on in your career. But we get all of these different agendas and we kind of we fill the curriculum with different things. We fill the time that we have with different things. So those are some of the common conceptualizations. I'm really interested in some of Fraser and Bosenke's work, which is actually an empirical piece of research, small scale. Um, they interviewed a range of staff across a range of dif uh, different disciplines in an Australian university. And from their study, they pulled out four different conceptualizations of how staff talked about curriculum. And again, it resonates with this idea of curriculum being about structure and content of a unit, uh, structure and content of a program of study. And this might be dependent on your role within teaching a particular degree program. So I talk about those as the product of um, curriculum. To these, these last two conceptualizations, um, much broader, the student's experience of learning and a dynamic and interactive process of teaching and learning. So again, how would you, if, if you were asked to describe what curriculum meant to you, to define curriculum, would you pull out all of these elements? Would you focus on one of these conceptualizations? And I raise it because I think it's important, as I said, for us to have an explicit understanding of how we view curriculum, because that influences the opportunities as teachers we might perceive students can work together with us. And one final idea, and again, um, this came out of some of the quality enhancement work in Scotland, colleagues at Edinburgh Napier, talked about perceiving curriculum as um, the driving force for institutional agendas. I'm sure you will each have experience of um, a learning and teaching strategy that has a new priority. How do we address sustainable development within the curriculum? How do we address diversity and internationalization within the curriculum? So the curriculum becomes this hook for different institutional agendas. And certainly from an academic development perspective where you're the mediator between institutional agendas and practice at the front line, quite often colleagues can say, just stop, I can't do, where do I prioritize what to do? And we need to be mindful that when we're talking about active student participation that we don't necessarily see it as another hook on the curriculum, that we're really starting to think about fundamentally what is the nature of how we are working together as masters and scholars within the curriculum? And where can partnership, where opportunities of partnership, where can they open up? So that's some of the literature base. I said that I would pull out for you some practical examples of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And this is really some of the heart of my own PhD research. So exploring motivations and perceptions of success. So what is it? What am I talking about when I'm saying students as partners or students co-creating curricula? Some examples, and some of these will not read as rocket science, and I hope that some of these you identify with. Um, very much so. Students giving feedback, students designing marking criteria, developing or influencing content, students being a full member of a, a complete redesign team whether that be a module or a program level, um, students designing their own learning outcomes, students co-assessing, and students co-delivering teaching. Now, it may be that you could tick the examples of all of these, and that would be really interesting to see. Do you have others that you would add to this? These are some of the case study examples that are coming out of the research literature and my own research. But within each of these, domains of activity, there are important aspects of process about the nature of the conversation, about the sharing of decision making and empowerment of different um, voices 
in the process of doing that. And it's really when you start to talk to people about the process of, of doing this work that you start to really um, get to the interesting thing about what co-creation might actually involve and how it's perceived and how it's managed. So if those are some of the examples of what it actually means, what it is, what useful tools can we use in, uh, and I'm perhaps aiming this specifically at colleagues in academic development roles, but for staff and students as well, um, what tools might help us think about and generate discussion of, of where are we in this power dimension? Where, where would we say we are? And um, Boval and Bully, um, you may have come across this idea of the ladder of student participation in curriculum design. And it, it's actually drawn from um, international development, community development uh, work and the idea of involving um, citizens in decision making. Um, and quite often, and I've heard Kathy present this work and, and, and have it critiqued as, well, is this some kind of normative device? Is the best place for us to be at the top? Because actually, no thank you. Um, that's not what we're talking about. But actually, what this, this ladder of participation can usefully be used as is a heuristic to say it's not a normative ideal. You know, we, it's not that we are necessarily here and we want to be here. If you turned it on the side and said it's a continuum, and where do, would you place yourself? Where are you now? Where would you like to be? Where do you not want to be? And could you use this as a heuristic device to actually enable conversation between staff and students? Check out whether you have a difference of opinion about where the decision making and the control and power actually works. And again, even if you're not already working with students in partnership, it might be that you could start to think about your own learning or your own teaching and use this idea of a ladder of participation um, as a way of thinking about where you're at just now. So, what are the different ways that staff and students, teachers and students, are talking about why they want to work together to co-create curriculum specifically? But I think some of these also resonate with the broader area of partnership work. So, my course is broken. There's a problem and I need to fix it as a teacher. And I think there's an opportunity and a unique perspective that me working with students could help me address this problem, might be one way. Um, in some of my interviews, colleagues are talking about, you know, I'm passionate about this subject, but I just know I've been a, t I've been a lecturer for many years and I just know my students are not engaged and I don't know why and I want to understand why. And I think working with students might give me, a, a, again, a different insight and, and open up new possibilities. This idea of I want to make my classroom more democratic, you know, these appeal to particular teaching philosophies. What do you think the nature of education is about? And how do you want to enact your teaching philosophy? And that might be that you have very specific ideals of democratizing the classroom. Um, you might just be interested, you might leave today, staff or student actually, saying, oh, I'm kind of, this has piqued my interest, I want to have a look and I, I've got some tentative ideas. Um, it might be that there are very structural levers that help give you the space and the opportunity. So that might be that the programme is being reviewed or there's an opportunity to develop a new module. It might be that funding is available uh, to buy out some time, buy some breathing space to actually um, innovate and be creative in working with students. It might be, and I'm aware at Uppsala that there are interesting conversations coming out of the ASP project, that students themselves are saying, hang on, we want to get involved here, we've got some ideas, how can we work with you to um, have an input to this? And again, finally, you know, student voices are important. This links to this idea of perhaps um, democratising the classroom. I want to make sure that I have a, a diversity of voices, students there is no one student voice. So how might I work with students to have a better understanding about the diversity of voices in my, my classroom, in my lab, in my seminars, and so on? Um, <clears throat> one thing I perhaps should have mentioned earlier, interestingly, of the case studies and of the literature that's published so far, um, it's very difficult to find individual narratives about students' experience of working 
on collaborating on curriculum design, which is kind of ironic when we're talking about students as partners. Um, so what I share here is very much, I was literally, I'm, I was interviewing last week. These are very much um, fresh in my mind. I haven't transcribed, let alone analyzed my data yet. But some of the ways and some of the things that students are talking about for their own motivations for getting involved. So I want to develop new skills. We talk about graduate attributes quite a lot in the UK. I don't think that's common language here. But this idea of not just transferable skills, but um, um, knowledge, dispositions, and attitude to um, ongoing development and so on. Some students, particularly mature students, that have quite a, a, an extensive professional background saying, I want to find a space to bring in my other life professional experiences. I've got something to offer and enhance, perhaps a very theoretical module. So I want to, I want to engage in a conversation there. Some students saying, this is purely about me developing my confidence. I have one interesting example of a student saying, you know, I'm an archaeology student and I, I've kind of realised that when we go out on field trips that there's something quite unique about that and, and we have these really interesting conversations and I want to understand what, why that seems to be a really positive learning experience. It's not just that it's fun and we go to the bar afterwards, but you know, there's something really powerful about going out into, to, do, to a, a dig site and uh, seeing what's happening. So students are wanting to understand the learning process better. Isn't that fantastic? I think that's great. Um, I'm biased. Um, I have some students, uh, one, one student that I, I, I've interviewed wanted to, develop, to develop new learning resources within her subject area, particularly because of her own disability. She was finding that the, the mode of delivery, the materials that she had access to were inaccessible. And she wanted to use her own experience to be creative and work with staff to develop new learning resources. Some students are very focused. They see it as an opportunity to build on experience and go on to either an education master's or a PhD. Um, and some students just want to give something back. They've had a positive experience and they want to be able to contribute and enhance that. So actually quite altruistic motivations there. People are always interested in the benefits um, of this work and um, I suppose whenever we're talking about evidence and, and benefits, I'm always quite hesitant to suggest that there's any necessary causal relationship. But there is some um, emerging literature that's talking about students showing um, enhanced engagement, um, an increased metacognitive awareness of this idea of understanding the process um, at a meta level of what's going on. So in, again, in my interviews, I'm in, interested in personal narrative and personal meaning making of this process. So things like students saying, do you know, being involved in designing a module, um, I'm not, one student said to me, I'm not sure I, I've necessarily come up with anything different than what my tutor might have come up with. But my God, I understand how difficult this is now. I really have a new appreciation of what goes into designing um, even an individual learning task. It doesn't have to be the program level um, discussions and so on. But, so those are the benefits. I think it's really important to be upfront and honest about um, some of the hesitation around working in this area. So, so staff are saying that it's risky, it's nerve wracking. Um, Equally, it's intense and demanding. So again, some of the colleagues that I've been interviewing are saying, do you know, I don't think I could have done this if I was an early career academic. It actually takes quite a lot of confidence for me to think on the spot and manage a whole set of unknowns. And if I was a new lecturer, I'm not sure I would have felt confident to do this. So what does that mean if you are a newer academic? Conversely, I think there are similar but different issues for students about managing the risk of, of this creative process of working together. Um, staff are talking about it being re-energizing, it's transformatory, um, but it is time consuming and quite often, and again, colleagues in educational development roles will recognize this, you can work with colleagues who say, so um, if I put the time in here, where do I save the time somewhere else? And again, I think we need to be honest and upfront that it is time consuming and it isn't necessarily going to be that you win back that time somewhere else. 
but it is about in, an investment on a richer kind of conversation. That's what people are talking about. So if those are some of the practical ways that people are, are doing and talking about their motivations for this kind of thing, perhaps at this point I could come back to some of the literature and, get, and share with you, again, what Healy and colleagues um, are beginning to bring out in the UK context. What values are we talking about underpinning? So not just the nuts and bolts of how do I do it, but what kinds of values might underpin partnership? And I share them with you here. Um, they talk about authenticity. Um, I personally find that quite a problematic phrase. What does authenticity mean? To whom? In what context? At what point in time? But I think where they're coming from is an authenticity about um, offering space for different voices and not making assumptions about um, homogeneity of the student voice, perhaps. Inclusivity, reciprocity, empowerment, trust. And trust is a big thing that's coming out of my own interviews, the, the time it takes to work out this new way of working and building trust. And I share the climbing picture there because uh, one academic that I interviewed um, is an avid climber and he said it's like, um, and the phrase has just gone out of my head, but this idea when you're climbing together and you're attached by a rope, if another climber falls off the side, you have to fall on the opposite side so that you save one another. Um, and this idea of building trust um, because it's a collaborative endeavour and you're in it together, um, whether you get to the summit or not, um, I thought was quite an, an interesting way of thinking about the process and how we work together. Challenge, this idea of community is something that um, you might be interested in looking at what Healy and colleagues have to say. They're talking about learning, partnership learning communities. And from what I've heard colleagues talk about here at Uppsala with the ASP project, I think there's potentially interesting sets of conversations going on around learning communities that you might want to think about how you could join in and where, where, where are those spots for those kinds of discussions. And responsibility. So if co-creating curricula might involve risk and being creative, how do we ensure that all parties, and I mean by that students as well as staff, share the responsibility of things that go well and things that go not so well? So this is a challenge to, challenge to the students in the room too, of how you view your education and, and, and opportunities to be creative, that when you take risks, those risks mean they might not always work out how you want them to. So how do you share the responsibility with your teaching colleagues for the outcome of, of that process of partnership? So um, <clears throat> I want to turn now to thinking about impact and success. And I'm going to share with you again some of Healy's work. But they talk about this idea of, of cognitive dissonance. And in the UK, um, I have a whole range of ac acronyms there. Um, UK higher education is measured by a number of instruments. Um, KISS is the key information sets. So that is a relatively new phenomenon where universities are required to publish certain data. That might include the number of staff that have um, completed a professional teaching qualification and so on, uh, contact hours, staff-student ratios and so on. Um, the National Student Survey, which has been heavily critiqued in the UK, and we are looking at um, other models that might replicate some of the um, tools used in the US, the National Survey of Student Engagement, for example. So we're moving away from a discourse of satisfaction to one of student engagement. Um, the Research Excellence Framework and Key Performance Indicators, these are very quantitative measures of success. And what Healy and colleagues talk about, and I think is really useful, is that if we're talking about partnership as a process, as a creative process, um, we're dealing with possibly unexpected outcomes. So it's a challenge for us to think about, well, what does success look like? And how will we know it when we see it? And how do we fit with the discourse in our institutions, uh, at policy level and at governmental level, with instruments that might be looking to measure and attach funding to, importantly, quite different aspects of university work. So some questions to share with you, and these are questions that 
I'm exploring with staff and students that I'm interviewing. So how do we know that our collaborations are successful? So I, I'm, I'm asking people, if I were to walk into a room and you're interacting, what's happening? Who's doing what? Who's saying what? How do you know when it's going well? What ways would you, what cues do you pick up on to demonstrate that this is um, co-creation in action? What indicators or measures do we feel are meaningful? And I mean that as practitioners, as teachers and students. What things do we think are important measures of success? Um, and do they look different depending on whether you are a teacher or a student, a member of staff or student? And is that OK? Um, I'm finding that staff and students have quite different motivations for working together. They might be working towards a shared goal, but they have really different motivations of why they're there. But something is working because they're achieving the successes that they want to see. Um, and then the tricky question is, how do we measure that? Um, how do the measures that we value, that we think are important to capture the success of our work, how do we have that conversation at institutional level with the people that control funding and influence um, other sets of decisions and priorities? How do we feed that in in a meaningful, useful way to show that we are developing an ethos of partnership and that is important and we can describe that and we can point to things that capture that. So just questions. But I think, um, again, I'd just like to point that our, our ideas of what success might look like are probably going to be linked to what our motivations for entering into this work is. So if, if you are a teacher and you say, my course is broken, you probably have an idea that a success is that it works better at the end. But what does better mean? How do you quantify that? How do you identify it? If you're a student saying, I want to work with other students and develop my confidence, what does success look like for you at the end of this? And how are you going to articulate it? And how are you going to let other people know that that's really important? I said I wanted to come back to this idea of where, are, where am I in the process. And I'm saying this as a practitioner as well as a researcher. Within my research, you know, I am required to reflect upon my methodology, where I am because of the approach that I'm taking, where I am and my, my um, personal experiences, my responses to the data collection, data analy um, analysis process. So what is my researcher reflexivity? But in very practical terms, as, as students and staff, as students as teachers working together, where do you see yourself in the process and how do you keep on track with your project goals and, and delivering on time? Where do you create the space both personally and collectively to reflect on the process of what's happening? How do you check in with one another that it's all right, that it's going well? How, how are you talking with one another? Where can you build in opportunities for that kind of reflection? It's important, I think, for the process, but also it's really useful data to capture along the way so that when colleagues are looking to demonstrate the process uh, um, and evaluate that, that you have something that is captured within the moment as well as a reflection on what happened. And finally, um, <clears throat> I have some questions. I said I wanted to set up some questions that I don't necessarily have the answers for. Questions and reflections for you to keep in mind as you continue the discussion today. So I'd suggest that conceptualizations of curriculum and how you understand active student participation will link to your motivations and your attitudes, your teaching philosophy, uh, your, your learning philosophy as a student, if you like. Staff motivations and attitudes will uh, link to the above are likely going to influence the types of opportunities that are offered to students. If you were to take a moment, where can you find the space to be creative and manage risk? One respond respondent said to me, um, I know that I work within a quite rigid bureaucratic framework to get my modules agreed and in, in the system and that I'm I'm right with the quality assurance processes. But within that, I have to find a creative space. And I manage to do that. Where would your creative spaces be? Where would you like them to be? Be transparent about what is and, and not open for negotiation. This is perhaps for teachers in the room. 
um, this starts to have a very honest conversation quite early on and be explicit why certain areas may or may not be open for negotiation and partnership working. What does ownership mean in any collaborative activity? And I raise this partly because I'm seeing projects that are finished. By the very nature, students graduate, they move on to other things. But they have been a part of a process. And certainly, if you are interested in publishing your work, how do you ensure that students are either involved in co-authoring so that their voices do come through in the literature, in the research literature, in an authentic way, in a legitimate way? How do you, what, what does that mean? How, do, how can you have that conversation together? Uh, small is absolutely OK. If you want to explore an individual learning task in one of your classes to see how it goes, that's absolutely <coughs> fine. And again, um, Kathy Bovell and colleagues um, in their work would say, you know, actually, they would actively advise not to start big. Um, develop the ways of working and, and, f and your confidence in working together, either as a student or as a, a staff member. Clear about your assumptions and ownership during and beyond. Um, I'd suggest discuss early on, and this idea of what does success look like. Even if you're not going to have a formal evaluation, perhaps have a, a discussion about um, how are we going to know if we've done good here? What, what's it going to look like at the end? Um, and discuss how the collaborative process will work. How are you going to manage conflicts? And a, a, inter, just an interesting reflection at this point in time for me. A lot of the literature talks about explicit conversations about values and motivations and so on. But I'm actually picking up some quite contradictory responses in my interviews where people are saying, no, we, we didn't have an explicit conversation. No, and it, and it went OK. And last week, someone reflected back to me, you know, actually, you've made me think in, in the process, if we had had that conversation, it could have cr killed some of the magic and the excitement. So how, how do you square that circle? How do you have that open conversation about how we're going to work together without freaking everybody out and saying, oh my goodness, you know, am, am I following the rules of the partnership? How do we balance those, those kinds of important conversations? And finally, um, the title was, um, you say it's a revolution. And I've, I've hopefully given you some ideas of very practical things that you might already be doing, and this might be a natural evolution for you. There might be some of you in the room that are really calling for something more radical, a real revolution. And I'd like to finish today saying I don't think it necessarily matters which side of the fence you're on, whether you're here because you're interested in a revolution or an evolution. You're joining the conversation today, and I think that's the important thing, and we're all heading in the right direction. So that's what I'd like to finish on. And I think we might have some time for questions. Yeah, we have at least 10 minutes for questions. We can stop here on the floor. Thank you.
interviewing her saying, do you know, I don't think I could have done this if I was an early career academic. It actually takes quite a lot of confidence for me to think on the spot and manage a whole set of unknowns. And if I was a new lecturer, I'm not sure I would have felt confident to do this. So what does that mean if you are a newer academic? Conversely, I think there are similar but different issues for students about managing the risk of, of this creative process of working together. Staff are talking about it being re-energising, it's transformatory, um, but it is time consuming and quite often, and again, colleagues in educational development roles will recognise this, you can work with colleagues who say, so um, if I put the time in here, where do I save the time somewhere else? And again, I think we need to be honest and upfront that it is time consuming and it isn't necessarily going to be that you win back that time somewhere else. But it is about in an investment on a richer kind of conversation. That's what people are talking about. Responsibility. So if co-creating curricula might involve risk and being creative, how do we ensure that all parties, and I mean by that students as well as staff, share the responsibility of things that go well and things that go not so well? Small is absolutely okay. If you want to explore an individual learning task in one of your classes to see how it goes, that's absolutely <coughs> fine. And again, um, Kathy Bovell and colleagues um, in their work would say, you know, actually they would actively advise not to start big. Um, develop the ways of working and, and, f and your confidence in working together either as a student or as a, a staff member. Where and when is it appropriate? to co-create things, and when is it not? Very often, finding space to do this in a safe, contained way and to be creative is really challenging. So timing and sustainability issues, the logistics of it. For staff and students, sometimes it just feels a little bit too scary, a bit too risky. Um, and sometimes the timing is just not right. So maybe they're just some of the reasons why um, it's rarer to find students involved. The students themselves are saying, hang on, we want to get involved here. We've got some ideas. How can we work with you to um, have an input to this? And again, finally, you know, student voices are important. This links to this idea of perhaps um, democratising the classroom. I want to make sure that I have a, a diversity of voices. Students, there is no one student voice. So how might I work with students to have a better understanding about the diversity of voices in my, my classroom, in my lab, in my seminars and so on.